just to welcome you to this service of worship and praise and to those that may be joining us later this week online we welcome you to there is no birthday party at the end of this service but thank you for all your considerations and concerns and greetings over past days i want to, to confess to you and to those who are watching later that I feel a strong sense of burden this morning um, and I will share that with you during the prayer time. Um, we are living at a time when many are suffering and I don't know how you feel about that but it really hits me between the eyes when I see and hear some of the things that are happening around us. But we're going to pray and we're going to read now from God's Word. It says, The eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts are perfect towards Him and can show His great power in helping them. Strong words from Second Chronicles. We're going to begin with a time of silence this morning. We're not even going to greet one another yet, but I want us to be still in God's presence and prepare us for worship. So let us do that. So we join the family of Christian people around this country and around the world and we sing together number 132, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. We'll stand to sing.
thanksgiving for our offering today and prayer. Lord God, you are hid from our eyes indeed. But thy great name we praise. And we thank you today, together as a family and your people, for this opportunity to worship together, to bring into your presence these gifts that are gifts of love that we pray will be used for your honour and glory in this place. Lord, accept these gifts and those that have given. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This morning we praise you that we can put our hand into yours, knowing that you will lead, support and hold us throughout our lives, that you will supply all our needs and far more besides, for you have touched our lives through your grace. We praise you for our experience of that truth through across the years, the way you have always held firm to us, despite our thoughts and faithlessness, never letting go of us even when we let go of you. You have touched our lives through your grace. Forgive us that we have often let go, intent of going our own way, clinging to what ultimately can never satisfy. Forgive us for doubting you when times are hard, questioning your ability to lead us safely through. Forgive us for reaching out only when we have need of you, expecting you to lift us up from trouble of our own making and set us on our feet again. You have touched our lives through your grace. So help us today to put our hand again in yours in simple trust, in quiet confidence, in eager expectation, knowing that whatever we face and wherever we may find ourselves, you will hold us firm because you have touched our lives through your grace. And in gratitude we respond with the words that you taught us to pray, say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, you may turn to each other and greet with the words, the peace of the Lord be with you. I wasn't going to let it happen at the beginning, but now I do. I saw one brave lady waving to somebody. <laughs> right, I have a few notices. <coughs> Excuse me. The first is that um, next Sunday the service will be conducted by three of our dear friends. Roma. Put your hand up. Serena. You can turn around, Serena. And Hilda. You can stand up and <laughs> we, we 
we are in delighted that they as a team are going to lead us in worship and Roma especially is going to preach on a very tender subject, how to deal with grief gracefully. And I invite you to pray for her during this week. I will be here and God willing will be preaching at St Paul's Mulgai in the evening. The session, I know this seems a long way off, but the 29th of August is the next session meeting and I invite you to put that carefully in your diary and we will look forward to that time together. The Guild recommences on the 6th of September. 6th of September. Have I got that right? Good. So we look forward to the beginning of a new session of the Guild meeting together and I understand from Margaret there are another 10 or more people who are joining the Guild this year which is really very encouraging, so we look forward to that. During our prayers of intercession, I want us to particularly remember those of our congregation who need our prayers, especially at this time. Jesse McGregor is very unwell and was unable to accept a visit on Friday. I hope to see her tomorrow. Please pray for Jesse and her family. Also, a younger lady, Elspeth, I can say it that way. Elspeth is still unwell and I'm going to be careful not to say more, but I'm sure that Eddie will bring you up to speed. Um, Elspeth was to have read the scriptures this morning, but um, Eddie has chosen to take her place, which I think is rather special. Thank you very much. Yes, I want to mention to you something that's really burdening me and that I think you will understand. I was out for a walk on Friday evening. Now, I don't walk long distances as Joy does, but I was walking along the Clyde Bank, the pathway. And as has happened several times now, I encountered a couple from the hotel where they are living as if I may use the word carefully, refugees. And then this morning I read, as you will have done, of those that died crossing the channel yesterday. When I listened to the story of the two maths teachers from Afghanistan, a married couple who are given nine pounds per week, I listened to their story of the journey from Afghanistan and across the channel in a dinghy. And I can tell you this, it was very, very moving. I don't know as a church whether there is anything we should or can do, but when I saw them carrying that bag of groceries that they had bought in the evening, I wondered if we should be giving something to them as refugees with very little. I know that there are all sorts of implications of that statement and I regret if I've upset anybody, but the reality is that I listened to a tale of real tragedy and it burdened me no end. I shared it with joy and I've shared it before with others, but I do feel that we need to really be aware of those that are on our very doorstep they're not down in Dover, they're on our doorstep and they're suffering. So we'll pray for them later. Right now I want us to sing to God's glory. The God of Abraham prays 162 and we'll stay seated to sing.
the ground is sinking sand. Loving God, we give thanks for your goodness and love towards us, for the joy of home and family, the companionship of friends and neighbours, the activities that fulfil our lives and the strength that supports us, for the love that surrounds us, both when our joy is complete and when it is touched by pain. We give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the glory of his humble birth, for the graciousness of his selfless life, for the obedience and trust that led him to the cross and for the triumph of his resurrection and ascension. We give thanks for your Holy Spirit at work in your church and in our hearts, revealing your truth, renewing our lives and bringing us your eternal kingdom. O oh God of love and power, we pray for your church in this parish and throughout the world, that through the courage and faith of your people, your word may be preached and lived. We pray for our community, for our country, for the nations of the world that following the ways of truth and justice, they may be ultimately free from bitterness and strife and by the power of your love live in peace. This morning we especially pray for those we know to be in trouble, that those who are sick may be cared for, those who are lonely sustained, those who are oppressed strengthened, for those who grieve, especially we pray for the families of those whose lives were lost in Hawaii, and we pray for those whose tragic deaths on the channel have led others to grieve deeply. Lord, in your mercy, draw near to such, we pray. And we would give thanks to you for those that have died in the faith, especially those known to us, those that have entered into the joy and peace of your nearer presence. Grant that we too may follow their example and live by faith and come to share with them the glory of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord who is to be worshipped and glorified forever. Amen. Eddie, would you come and read God's precious word to us? Thank you. The reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, and it's titled, Faith in Action. Now faith and confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command so that the sea was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God to a better object in kingdom. By faith he was commended as the righteous and God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death and could not be found, because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he was those who earnestly seek him. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world, 
and to give ear of the righteousness that is the keeping of faith. And in faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, to the architect and builder of God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childhood at very age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when he died. They did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Amen. And for that is God's Thank you, Eddie. We're going to sing again, and the uh, hymn is number 535, Who Would True Father Sing? Now, this is a pilgrim hymn. I invite you to stand and sing. chapter reads like this, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I wonder if you have ever sat in your car, as I have done several times in recent months, alongside the runway at Glasgow Airport. Have you done that? I would commend that to you as a very thrilling experience because even though Joy is smiling as I speak, when you observe 
one of those large aircraft coming out of the bottom of the cloud, what you're observing is the faith that is being shown by the pilots that they're on the right course and that they're going to land safely. I've done it many, many times and I can tell you that verse, being sure of what you hope for, which is to land, and certain of what you do not see because the cloud is in the way, is a very vivid illustration to me of what this faith business is all about. Because you are trusting where you cannot see that when eventually you break out of the base of the cloud, there in front of you will be the runway. Now in case you think I'm taking a liberty, I would invite you seriously to go to the airport and take that little road that runs along the runway and sit there until you see an aircraft land out of the clouds. Maybe you're looking puzzled. It is a very intriguing experience because what I'm about to try and explain to you is what the Christian life is about, which is the life of faith, hoping for what you cannot see. You can't contain God in a 20 minute sermon, nor even in a 45 minute one. Interestingly, some weeks ago I mentioned to you about a, a friend of mine who is a Congolese pastor in St. Andrew's Fife. And he is well known for 45 to one hour sermons. I mentioned it here once, I think. And he, when he came to my previous church, told me to tell the congregation to bring their lunch. <laughs> because he would be preaching for 45 to one hour. But you can't contain God in even that length of time. We worship, you see, we worship a God that we cannot see, cannot truly understand, cannot adequately explain, and cannot prove. Ancient forms of faith allow us to return to a sense of mystery rather than containing God in a box made of words. There are several chapters in the Bible that are famous or stand out for a certain theme or topic which they address and this is a classic example in Hebrews chapter 11. Eddie only read 13 verses but I would invite you to go home and read the entire chapter devoted to the topic of faith. It's a favourite passage for many because it explains and describes what faith is and it gives many practical and concrete examples of the various aspects of faith. Now, we don't know who actually wrote this chapter because Hebrews is the one book in the New Testament that is anonymous. Whoever the author was, however, we know that it, he or she was inspired by the Holy Spirit and that God was the ultimate author. Now there are excellent reasons to study this chapter. One reason of course is that it is the Word of God. It's always profitable to study God's Word. The second reason is that it's all about faith and faith is foundational to the Christian life. You cannot become a Christian without faith. You cannot live as a Christian without persevering faith. You cannot grow as a Christian unless you are growing in faith. So faith is the foundation to the Christian life. Even the disciples once called out to Jesus in Luke's Gospel we read these words. They called out, Lord, increase our faith. Now you and I are all at different points of our Christian walk and maturity. Some of you 
have been walking with the Lord for a long time. Yes? Some of you may only just be getting started. Some of you perhaps have leveled off and stopped growing altogether. Or perhaps you have grown or been a Christian for some time but never really grown in your faith. So no matter where you are in that pattern, no matter where you are, this chapter is for you. Can I ask a question? What wonderful things does God have planned for you as a believer? And I wonder, together with you, what has God planned for this congregation? I read the uh, church magazine again this morning before I came out. And Colin is saying some very striking things in his comments about the future of this congregation. And next week, Roma is going to un unpack the idea of the Christian family and what is the future for this family of believers here. Well, it seems to me that we have some answers in the book of Hebrews and in this chapter in particular because we have a definition of faith being sure of what we hope for and faith being certain of what we do not see. So let's think about faith being sure of what we hope for. Let's get started. This is not going to be a 45 minute sermon, I promise you. Maybe an hour, but it will not be too long. <coughs> it's a challenging sermon, it's a challenging message because Faith is being sure of what you hope for. This isn't some brand new topic that the writer of Hebrews just snatches out of the blue. He has already spoken about this in chapters 4, 6 and 10, and he goes on to say more in chapters 12 and 11. But right here, the word faith in this chapter appears 31 times in the book of Hebrews and 24 times in chapter 11. So, what does it mean? Well, Habakkuk, the Old Testament prophet, put it this way, the righteous shall live by faith. And that verse from Habakkuk is a central verse because Paul quotes it in Galatians and Romans as a key verse that supports the doctrine of salvation by faith in Christ alone. The one that was the key to Martin Luther's ministry and the rediscovery of that biblical doctrine led to the Reformation. The reason you and I are here in a Presbyterian church in the 23rd year of the reign of 2023 is because of Martin Luther's exposition of that great theme, the just will live by faith. As I said earlier, all we do as Christians comes from faith. You cannot become a Christian without faith and you certainly can't live as a Christian without faith. Faith not only starts you on your way, but like that hymn I tried to, there's a solid rock on which we stand. You cannot have a solid faith without Christ as the solid rock. Now, as Christian people, we are here living on planet Earth, but we're on a journey, we're on a pilgrim journey, heaven bound. And yes, I know, I know that we struggle with trials and pain and sin, but one day, if we persevere to the end, we will know freedom from all of that. Now, faith is being sure of what you hope for. And being sure means exactly what I was trying to portray in that music that we had. Something that's secure on which we stand. Something that isn't going to give way when things get tough. Things that are the foundation is going to keep our hope alive, even when trials come our way. 
Hope is to wait with confidence and assurance. Some people respond to the question, do you think things will get better? They respond with the words, I hope so. But this is not a kind of despairing hope. This is a hope which has confidence and assurance. It's the hope that enabled David to say, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you, and I wait in confident expectation. How do you keep that kind of hope alive in your life? And how do I keep it alive in my life? We don't just pin our hopes up in the air and hope against hope that everything is going to be all right. That is not Christianity. Faith is being sure and strong foundation that gives us confidence and assurance that we need. It's the kind of faith that you have when you're sitting in the cockpit of an aeroplane and you can't see the runway and you're trusting the instruments in front of you to take you safely to the ground. Being sure of what you do not see. Certain of what you do not see. So, what I want to say to you briefly is that if you cannot, if you can see it, it is not faith. There are two things that we need to grasp from that definition. If you can't, if you can see it, it is not faith. We live by faith and not by sight, says Paul in 2 Corinthians. You see, faith and sight are the opposites in that verse. If you can see it, it's not faith. If you could see God, then it would not take any faith at all to believe in him because you would actually see him. If you can see it, it is not faith. How about if God asks you to do something that you already know how to do it? Well, it doesn't take a lot of faith, does it? If you already know. But when God calls you to do something that is outside your comfort zone, outside your own level, that's when you start talking about faith. I think that was partly the reason why this church was built. Because people had faith. They trusted that, they, that one day there would be a church family again here. I think that's amazing. And we need to grasp that. If you can see it, then it's not faith. What about the person who sincerely believes in a false religion? or worships an idol with a deep conviction of heart. Is that biblical faith? Will that save them? No, because if it's not real, then it's not true biblical faith. Faith is the foundation that gives strength to your hope, the conviction of your heart concerning realities that you cannot see. Idols don't save people. However much faith people may want to place in them. There's a reference in the passage that Eddie read to Old Testament believers, Old Testament elders. I, I don't know what your interpretation of the word ancient is, but I see that as the meaning for elders. Simply those who were in leadership and authority in the church. But scattered across the pages of history, we read some of it in that reading, different people who exhibited faith, building an ark when you, it's not raining. The ancients were commended for their faith. They had a good report in the area of faith. So what does that mean for you and for me? Well, I simply want to commend it to you as meaning that we, in our generation and in our time, need to trust and have faith that God is in control. 
For faith is the foundation that gives strength to our hope and a deep conviction concerning realities that we cannot see. Let me close with a simple example. I opened with an example about flying. I closed with an example about the TV. Now, Hilda has got some kind of control in her hand. There it is. And you and I know that we all use one of these devices that controls the TV screen. I don't know, and I'm sure you may not know exactly how a TV works. But when I can get the remote from my wife and I press the on button, I expect the TV to turn on. Why? Because I have learned over time that although I cannot see the electricity running and I don't know how it all works, I can trust what is going on behind the scenes even though I don't physically see it. As long as the TV is plugged in and working, as long as there are working batteries, Hilda, in the remote, and the electricity is on, then I know the TV is going to turn on. I have learned, if I may put it this way, to have TV remote faith over time. And it's the same way in the spiritual world. I can't see God, but I can trust him. A man was walking on a mountain road and he came upon an Indian lying in the middle of the road with his ear to the ground. The Indian was muttering in <coughs> excuse me, broken English, truck, heavy truck, Chevy pickup truck with large tires, man driving, German shepherd in front seat, loaded with firewood, California license plate, UBA 123. The man was astounded and said to the Indian, you can tell all that by just listening to the ground? The Indian said, no, the truck ran over me 30 minutes ago. Life is like that. We don't always see what is coming and sometimes it runs right over us. But I believe, and I gave this passage of scripture to one of our members this morning, I gave it in fact to Bill Rooney's wife, who's in the hospital or nursing home. All things work together for good. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And when you read those words, what does it take to believe them? Faith. Faith, forsaking all I trust him. Can I say that again? Forsaking all I trust him. Let us pray. Help us, O oh God our Father, to follow the footsteps of those who have gone before those in the ancient world while scriptures were being written, those who we have known over the years that have walked the life of faith, help us, we pray, to walk that same walk and be blessed and a blessing. For this we pray in Christ our Saviour's name. So we follow that theme in the last hymn, 743, Behold What Witnesses Unseen.
Hebrews chapter 12. Now let us pray. Almighty God, we commend ourselves to your care. We pray that in your mercy you would watch over each and every one of us this coming week. And let us know of your grace and mercy afresh. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.